Augustus is the sole ruler of the world, the, the Roman world anyway. Um, but so he has to put in place this new settlement. He has to really um, make it clear what the Roman world is now. Sure, we're not in the days of the Republic of the Gracchi or earlier. Well, you know, everyone knows. You can't pull the wall over everyone's eyes that much. We're not in that world anymore. But we're certainly nowhere near sort of the age of Domitian or Vespasian or something, where it's, I'm, simply, I'm simply an emperor. Right? We're, so it's somewhere in between. So he's got a balance, a political balancing act, propaganda and political balancing act to do. And so I think that was the point where you got up to, I think it's 27 BC, is it? Where the Senate sort of say to him, have all the power, <laughs> basically have it all. And he says, no, 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 I can't possibly do that. I don't want to be a dictator. And there's, there's this sort of faux back and forth. And, and um, well, sorry, I'll let, I'll let you pick up the story again there, because I think that's an absolutely pivotal moment, perhaps, politically speaking, the most pivotal moment. Perhaps is that the moment when any last vestige of the Republic dies and we are in a monarchy then at that point? Well, the, the, there's so many things to answer. I mean, I, I don't yeah. think I, I don't think it's fair to say the Republic dies and the, the monarchy begin. I, I really want to unpack what that means, essentially. So there are three titles and there are two political authorities which are essential in terms of understanding what octavian now you know caesar augustus or augustus caesar represents it's interesting again you mentioned right at the beginning the idea of seniority so the idea of augustus caesar and caesar augustus are often sort of flipped in terms of emphasis caesar emphasizing julius who is now a god or augustus representing the octoritas of octavian now augustus himself so let me just from the beginning we see the title of imperator which is going to become emperor. It simply means commanding imperium, i.e. the ability to command armies, but there's also the implication that one is victorious. So far, Augustus has been able to demonstrate imperium incontrovertibly to the point of basically it almost becomes redundant his position, but that is integral to his power because imperium being emperor means that he effectively has supreme command over the Roman armies, which is something that no other person in Roman history was ever able to achieve unless you had the temporary powers of the dictator effectively. So that in itself is remarkable. And that is, you can say, the fundamental transition which makes the Republic more of a constitutional ornament than representing a power body in and of itself. So in terms of your emphasis on the transition from Republic to monarchy, that is absolutely key to understand. And that is also where we see, you can say, the degeneration of that position into the barracks emperors, where the emperors only represent imperium, they only represent the authorities of the army. But of course, because Augustus is so much more brilliant than that and so much of a pivotal figure of that, that is only one aspect, of course. The other thing you mentioned is princeps. As you also mentioned, the idea of categorizing phases of Roman history, Principate, which then becomes more sort of commonly known as the dominate after we have the emperor of Diocletian in the third century, after the crisis of the third century. What Principate effectively means is that Augustus will not accept the position of supreme power, as you've mentioned. He will consciously and repeatedly, it should be emphasized, reject that position of ultimate power, which has constantly been offered to him. And he will always, almost as part of a ritual in and of itself, he will conspicuously, and you can almost say as a political charade, I will reject that power. But that in turn only makes him more indispensable to the system. The fact that power, whenever there, for example, is a crisis, we must always give more power to Augustus. That's always the response. Mm -hmm. It is always, mm -hmm. Augustus mm -hmm. is essential to the system. So this is really important to understand what princeps means. It means mm -hmm. first citizen, literally, but that effectively means that Augustus is peerless. Yes, Augustus is not a king, and yet no one can aspire to be Augustus. Mm. Augustus mm. is the first, you know, he will represent, you know, his villa on a, a long sort of chain of sort of patrician estates. He will not stand above them in terms of alone, but at the same time, anyone who aspires to that rank will be killed, like the uh, during the Capio conspiracy a few years later. Um, all such, you know, aspirations are going to be thwarted. And so you have the 
you can say the more lofty aspirations of this republic idea of princeps, and then you have the hard reality of imperium, which is the Praetorian garrisons within Rome itself, which again is a complete departure from tradition. I am not going to be Julius Caesar. I'm not going to go into the Senate without also carrying a sword and be represented by this vast, you know, almost legion, given the number of cohorts of bodyguards. I have my own personal legion, which is not there to protect the Republic. It is there to protect the person of the princeps. So that's the second title. Now, here we come to the coup de grace, which is Augustus. It isn't a title, funny enough, that is conceived of by Octavian, Julius Caesar, or even by Mecenas, but someone called Plancus, uh, who was basically nothing more than you know, a professional sycophant, effectively. But nevertheless, it is genius in terms of construing what effectively means, because Augustus was a novel, a novel position. It had no political authority in and of itself. Rather, it represented the summit of personal political prestige. It represented auctoritas. It was basically a position, again, like Princeps, that was unobtainable, that stood above the norms of the conventional republic. It was an honorific to be bestowed on Augustus and Augustus alone. But in terms of understanding what that term really means, it effectively means the revered one, the respected mm. one. But also... It so many religious back. connotations, wouldn't you say? Well, exactly. Going back to the foundation of the Republic, the term which in essentially re represents the inception of Rome itself is the city which was inspired by august augury, i.e. we will create the most veered and greatest city, which is essentially going to be, you know, the Kivitas Day, the city of God, Kivitas Mundi, the city of the world. And it was inspired by an original august prophecy religiously ordained that Rome will effectively conquer the world. So when it comes to Augustus, it represents the culmination. Everything has been leading up to this point. The anticipation of Augustus, and now the divine revelation is here. The descendant of Aeneas, that which is prophesized, mm. has come back and mm. become this position. I am the result of prophecy. I am Augustus, and I shall forever stand as the realization of the ultimate political project of Rome. And of course, the irony is you can see that as the most blatant case of grandiose propaganda making, and yet also realize that it represents truth in the same way. He is the realization of some sort of grand imperial vision. He is the realization of the consolidation of Rome to effectively conquer the world. So it's not just enough that it represents propaganda, but the propaganda also represents reality, which of course is the most effective propaganda in terms of being able to establish that enduring legacy. But those are just the honorifics. Now we come to the actual power that Augustus wield personally. 27 is a pivotal year, but also 23, because in 23, Augustus decides to do away with him having to personally be consul, which is how he was able to formally control armies through the use of those magistrate positions. Instead, he decides, no, I am going to leave the office of consul to the other senators. I no longer need the consul position. Instead, what I'm going to do effectively is realize the consolidation of the Roman Empire into two distinct areas. One is senatorial and one is represented by imperium effectively, the imperial provinces and the senatorial provinces. I will have no personal power over the senatorial provinces. I will simply have equality whenever I enter, say, for example, Sicily with whoever the um, uh, proconsul is within that territory. But when it comes to the imperial provinces, they will be designated as legatus, directly essentially there as a result of imperial authority. And I will not have consular authority, but I will have permanent proconsular authority, i.e. the power to delegate whoever I want to control all of these provinces around the periphery. So effectively, he makes the position of consul nothing more, like I said, than an ornament. He allows all of these senators to petition to have the rank of consul, which is a rank of, again, esteem and personal prestige within the empire. But also it is effectively irrelevant because all the power to command legions is now held by he who has pro-consular authority and not consular authority. And again, another title that you mentioned in 23, which is the office of the tribune. And indeed, another lesser role, of course, is the office of the censor. Both the censor's position and the tribunal position had effectively receded and fallen into abeyance. The last person to really wield tribunal power 
to the point that it threatened the Republic in the eyes of the aristocracy was Tiberius Gracchus. But the tribunal authority effectively gave Augustus a constitutionally sacred position, which should be noted that to attack Augustus was basically to attack the Republic and they shall instantly die as a result of that. It's again something Julius Caesar was never able to achieve. But what the position of tribune effectively meant is that Augustus could come to the Senate, even not being consul, and he could propose legislation, he could stand, he could officiate over trials, and he could veto propositions by the Senate, and he could basically also run things by the creation of a small council. So of all intents and purposes, he may have dispensed with technically the highest rank in the Roman Republic, but for all intents and purposes, he has the power of military command and he has the power of legislative initiative. So basically you can say that the office of a tribunal is very similar to the office of a US president, if that makes sense. The ability to legislate and the ability effectively or to initiate legislation through the Senate, through the legislative branch and the ability to veto. Effectively, political initiative lies with Augustus and part political power lies with Augustus. And the irony, of course, is that these were effectively reserve powers. These were not powers that Augustus was content to simply remain in Rome and you know, dispense liberally. He would often spend his time you know, going around the provinces and consolidating each of the provinces, because again, he held the idea of proconsular authority very seriously. So whenever there was a crisis in Rome, it was seen that these powers, these reserve powers of Augustus were not enough. We need to bring Augustus back to have more power, you know, seize the office of censor more sort of viscerally, you know, seize the power of dictator, take the power of consul. And you can almost say that this is the true monarchical transition in 23, mm, mm, because yes. the Republic has survived as an ornament. The Republican institutions have been, in terms of Augustus's own vision, they have been stabilized, they have been reified more senators are now being able to participate and find individual glory and you know governorships than ever before it is stabilized you were able to essentially participate in the government in a way that was lethal before augustus came along but augustus has become a monarch because all of these authorities that you mentioned (laughs) have essentially become personal they are nothing to do with the republic they stand above the republican institutions Mm -hmm. augustus if he wanted to could come back and dispense with the republican institutions and could basically manipulate events there and it is these powers that represent the caesarean imperial office that he is effectively able to pass to tiberius and his various legacies effectively so that is the brilliance of augustus in that he was able to create something which is novel which gave him all the powers of a monarchy. And again, this is this is pivotal in terms of understanding the entire trajectory of political power going forward in terms of understanding this. All of our idea of monarchy, being able to command armies, commander in chief comes from Augustus. The idea of monarchy being able to represent the supreme arbiter of justice as the tribune comes from Augustus. The idea of monarchy as representing the ability effectively to designate governors and to designate a small council and to initiate legislation, all of this comes from Augustus to the point that the Senate effectively becomes a parliamentary institution, but also a parliamentary institution which Augustus allows them to indulge in the fantasy of actually having supremacy over the office of the empire. And you mentioned the idea of it being a hereditary office. No imperial office throughout the entire history of the Roman Empire, even up until the you know, Fourth Crusade in 1204 was formally hereditary. It was always still technically the grant of the Senate, but of course it would, became nothing more than a acclamation. I will be emperor by acclamation and the Senate is there simply to officiate over and to justify what is already inherent in me, which is all of these powers. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.